you know, uh, we were looked at back in the 50s when we started. It was really out here on the fringe. But uh, you go to the Corn College now, listen to those guys. They're talking about calcium. And see, we believe it's our subject because it is really the driver in the soil. And this thing with soil health or soil quality, we think it's tied to it directly. We understand that there are different things you can do to try to physically improve that biological life in soil. Uh, to me, it just goes back to what my grandfather was doing. I farm in northwest Ohio. We have about 500 acres of corn and beans. We've been on this program since 1955 when the company started. And when you go back to what my grandfather was doing, basically rotational agriculture, milking cows, had a few uh, beef cows around, and some pigs and chickens. That's how you built biological life in the soil, with that forage growth, and then you came back and you stimulated the biological life with the manure. Our issue today is society doesn't want farming like that. They want big equipment, they want a lot of acres by one guy. And it's very difficult to maintain that. You know, we work with guys that have 30,000 head cattle feeding operations. We're work working with 1,500 cow dairies. That's what society is demanding, and that is taking away from this rotational agriculture where you actually build that biological life. The way we think you as a farmer can mimic that is to try to build that root zone under the plant. This is your foundation right here, gentlemen. If you don't get a rain for three weeks, and that doesn't seem to be your problem this year, but if you go back to 2012, it certainly was the problem across the corn belt. And that's when these fields occurred in 2012 in the state of Michigan. They were basically in the heart of the drought, just like they were in Illinois when the price of corn went to eight bucks. And rain for two months, basically, for those guys. And what you've got in this picture are two approaches. One guy that's using calcium to build biological life in soil, and the other guy that's basically using the pH test to determine how much calcium he puts on the land. We had a gentleman this morning saying, well, we're developed from limestone soils. How could we not have enough calcium? Problem is, gentlemen, Solubility becomes the big issue. If you read Ferry and some of the data he left this year from the Corn College, what did he tell you? The soil test is only a guideline. It is proof positive of nothing. Why is that, gentlemen? Because it's a chemical extraction. How do you take a soil test? You go out and you probe in the field. You pull the soil out in the probe. You send it to the lab. What's the first thing they do to it? Drier down, drier down. They desiccate it. Because why? If you send it in in a mud ball after a, a rain shower, they can't separate it. So they got to desiccate it first. What do they do? They dry it to a form that you can never grow a crop in, guys. And then the next thing they do is they grind it. Because why? They got to get it in a test tube. When they grind it, gentlemen, any of those coarse particles in there become fine and they start to react in the test tube. So all that calcareous clay, all that calcium rock you've got out there natively that's not soluble out in the field becomes soluble in the test tube. And they tell you, oh, you got all kinds of calcium. But it's not working out in the field, John. And then they tell you, well, if the pH is over 6.5, you've got plenty of calcium. Magnesium, sodium, potassium, nitrogen, phosphorus, all of those elements, when you apply it to that soil, changes pH. pH can't possibly tell you what your calcium levels in soil. So that's why we as a company have ignored the soil test and particularly the pH test. Because when you put that calcium out there, it has to dissolve, and it physically can change your soil. And see, this is what the guys in the room that use our protocol, that's what they're trying to do, is to relieve any of that density that's in there. Now, they're telling you that when you improve soil quality, you'll take care of that density, and they're correct. But the way you achieve that, in our opinion, needs calcium as part of your program. 
I'm not advocating any one of these particular tillage approaches because all the guys that work with our calcium have different tillage approaches. But you've got to get that calcium in there to change the physical properties of your soil. It flocculates clay. And basically, Ferry has been writing about that in Farm Journal from the Corn College Basics for quite a few years now. Article in one of the farm journals in February of 2013, written by Ferry, talking about how calcium flocculates your soil. When you get it to a certain level on the clay particle, the clay acts differently. You have to overrun the magnesium position in order to get the calcium to work correctly and open the soil up. So what? It can breathe. You've got to get air space back in there, gentlemen. When you put that seed in the ground, guys, you want that root to go as deep as fast as possible. Why? Because there's going to be some seasons where it's just not going to rain every other day or every other week. You've got to be able to be down here to buffer yourself against that adversity. And this is what this gentleman was doing by getting that calcium level high in the soil. This gentleman put on a couple ton of dolomite and thought that would get the job done. We think you have to look at the exchangeable calcium in the soil. Your CEC and that percentage should be 80% in our opinion. Squeeze that magnesium down to about 10. Now how much lime is going to take to do that? We'll guess. But actually the best soil test you've got, gentlemen, is go right out there and vary the rate. Do the strips. Let the soil talk back to you. The establishment will tell you that's junk science. But I'll tell you right now, you read the modern publications, and all they talk about in there, this is um, progressive farmer talking about his root worm uh, material that he's using. What's he tell you to do? Vary the rate and see what happens out in the field. We agree with that 100%. We were telling Steve that for 35 years. He thought we were nuts. Steve, get out there and do the strips. So accidentally, what's he do? He gets a strip in. And then he's out there combining in that hog internationals plugging, and he can't figure out what the problem is. Well, he's got more yield where he got the calcium on. Because now he's got the strip talking back to him. Because the soil is a biological medium. It's not a chemical entity. That's what that soil test is, guys. It's a chemical extraction, and your soil is biological. All you guys in here talk about density. Why? Because you don't want the soil so compact that the biological life can't breathe and the root can't breathe. It's got to be porous so that the root penetrates, the air gets back in there, the root can exist. You're thinking of a green-growing crop as a photosynthetic machine. By that I mean it intercepts sunlight, makes carbohydrate using carbon dioxide, and then it gives off oxygen. That is correct during daylight hours. Overnight, what is the plant doing? It builds the seed by breathing, just like you guys are right now. And down here in this root zone, it's breathing all the time. That's why you got to get air in there. And we think soil biological life helps you do that, but we think calcium is the key to making that happen. This thing with biological life, and uh, I don't know why the, no, I guess the John Deere boys, are the John Deere boys still here? You guys put out the best publication on biological life that I've ever seen. We actually tried to get our deer salesmen to get us more copies of this to hand out to farmers because it is the best discussion of microbial activity in soil that I've ever seen. This is February of 2013. And what it tells you, gentlemen, is that when you look at this root, there's a small area that surrounds that root. It's about two millimeter in diameter that's called the rhizosphere. And inside that rhizosphere, you've got bacteria, mycorrhizal fungi, and actinomycins, and they're living in a synergy with this crop. It's beneficial because what is happening is the crop makes sugar to make its T 
tissue or to make it see it's bleeding that sugar down into the root zone that the microbes get a hold of it and they eat it and they grow but they don't suck it all away from the plant they turn around and dissolve minerals such as NP and K and feed the crop symbiosis is what it's called gentlemen you all heard of it in high school biology if you were awake that day rather than thinking about the opposite sex but this is key to you cutting back on that fertilizer use and getting that plant to perform the way it belongs. And calcium helps you do that. Because when you put high calcium lime on and you open that soil up, that biological life breathes and functions, but it also eats it, just like you and I do. Everyone in this room has read about the need for calcium in your diet. And you say, well, that's true because I got bones and teeth. And that is correct. However, during the Nixon administration, they showed that the need for calcium in the cellular tissue was paramount. And these microbes are the same way. They need that calcium in order to proliferate and grow and to be productive as far as the crop is concerned. Once you do that, the need for fertility goes down significantly, guys. These microbes actually will dehydrate themselves and water the crop. That's why this crop on this side of the field is green and healthy. And on that side of the field, it's burn up. They got the same amount of rain, guys. You don't have a road down the middle here separating the fields. I mean, they're right next to each other. You get that biological life working for you, you're much more competitive than if you don't have it working for you. We don't doubt that you can put on more fertilizer and try to get yield. But when potash went from 185 a ton to 656 a ton, now you got a problem. And see, we think that calcium can help you overcome that. The biggest key is not to be intimidated by pH, not to be intimidated by the fact that the soil test says you don't need it. Always remember, Soil test is chemical extraction. Your soil is biological. It lives and it breathes. That's why you're so concerned about not farming it too wet by getting the proper tillage tool to get that soil opened up so that this happens. You don't want this, guys. These agronomists that tell you you only have to worry about the fertility in the top eight inches never ran out of rain in the middle of summer for a month or six weeks. You don't put up a half million dollar building on a 10 cent foundation. So why should you do that with your crop? And see, we think you can build that foundation by getting that calcium in that soil at the proper level. We start out looking at CEC saying get it 80% calcium, 10% magnesium. Keep that 8 to 1 ratio in there. And see, getting the proper limestone is correct there also. Now, <clears throat> the new thing on the scene now is gypsum calcium sulfate. Can you use that to replace calcium? Absolutely. Cost is the factor though because we believe it takes so many pounds of calcium to get that soil opened up and to get it percolate. And if the cost per pound of calcium is very, very high in gypsum, you may be better off with carbonate. They're telling you not to use carbonate because it's going to drive the pH to the moon. Well, if it's high enough in calcium, where the level is eight times higher than the magnesium, you can't overline the soil. We've got guys that have already tried that. You know, we've got guys all over North America just like Steve Cuddleback. They believe what they can go home and prove to themselves. We tell them they can't overline, so they put on 200 tons of the acre on a garden space, and guess what? The old guy's wife grows azaleas in there. I don't know anything about flowers, but they tell me you need a low pH to grow an azalea. So my interpretation is you need 200 tons of the acre high calcium lime to lower the pH to grow an azalea. See, it's just incorrect. The chemistry you're getting is incorrect in our opinion, and the way you can figure it out is go to the field and find out. See if we're right, see if we're wrong. That's what guys like Steve have done, and we're, we're glad that you come to his operation and see what he's doing because we think this pretty well bonifies what we've been saying from day one.
Century Farm, man, that's just great as far as we're concerned. Because Steve didn't start this thing. You know, his dad was working with our people way back in the 50s. He talks about the Johnson administration. Man, you got to get before that. Now, if you're going to be out of business, if we're going to wear out soil, I would think it would be wore out a long time ago. I don't know what this stuff's going to yield over here, but I've been around the country, and I'll tell you right now, it's going to be pretty competitive. So don't let them intimidate you about calcium, gentlemen. This is what you want to try to do if you want to build soil quality, in our opinion. <clears throat> We're not here to tell you what tillage method is correct or what paint you need. We're here to tell you whatever you decide, when you get the calcium where it belongs, it'll work a lot better. 